Thanks, Lord. Mm -hmm. Good morning and welcome to session three of Power in the Spirit. I believe that the Spirit is real and can work in our lives today. I believe that the Holy Spirit is not a thing to be possessed or a power to be used. It's a relationship with God. Today I want us to start with a word and a question. When did the disciples, the first followers of Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit? So let's go to the Word. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And since we're not live, we're going to take time to look things up and read them together. I'll just redact things out. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Marsh, do you have it? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I misread your body language. Got it. Katrina? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with the tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now when you ask me when the disciples received the Holy Spirit, this is what immediately comes to mind for me. But I got to studying, and you know, there's some other passages that uh, kind of startled me. So Pentecost, but go, but go and look at John chapter 20, verse 22. John chapter 20, verse 22. Brian? And when he had said this, he breathed, <laughs> breathed on, on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Isn't that an amazing image? Okay, remember that the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. The Hebrew word is ruah. They both mean breath okay and Jesus breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit okay when did they receive the Holy Spirit okay while you're thinking about that I don't want you to answer because I don't want to set you up here okay but this was in the upper room after the resurrection Okay. But it specifically says that he had not been glorified and the Holy Spirit had not been given yet. And yet he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now go back to Matthew chapter 10. And verses 5 through 8 and then verse 20. Vivian, can you read this one for us? These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, Cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. 
and verse 20, for it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father, which speaketh in you. Now, this, this was not when, this was not when um, Jesus called the 12. They've been with him some time studying, following him. But this is when he sent them out. Now, <clears throat> we're going to have a big evangelistic campaign here, okay? And I want each of you to go out and start knocking on door, door to door, and I want you to go to all the communities in Wayne County, okay? And I want you to tell them the kingdom of heaven is here. And while you're doing that, I want you to heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, Okay. They they didn't they didn't just blindly go and do this. They already had experience with this. Okay. Uh, and uh, in Matthew twelve twenty eight, we're not going to read it, but this is when Jesus and and the Pharisees were having an argument. The Pharisees were accusing him of casting out demons through the power of Belzebub, which in Jewish mythology was the chief demon. Okay, um, and Jesus said, "That's ridiculous." Okay, I cast out demons through the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes the Holy Spirit to cast out demons. So if Jesus is telling the disciples to go heal, raise the dead, cast out demons, he is saying, "You have the power of the Spirit in you." So when did the disciples receive the Spirit? Now, I stumbled onto this in a conversation with Bobby, and I was like, wow, is this what it's like to receive the Spirit today? I mean, it's like waves. Whoom, whoom, whoom. And that got me thinking about things that happen on a periodic fashion in our lives, things that happen now and again and again, okay? And maybe it's because it's winter, Maybe it's because I've been doing this a lot, okay? But uh, you know, we have a fireplace in our house, and when I start a fire, okay, it's not just that I forget to put wood on there, and so I'm having to do this a lot, okay? But when you light a fire, it, what happens if I walk away at this point? It goes out. So what I have to do is I have to get down there and I have to blow on it. Now, I'm fairly long-winded, but not even I can start a fire with one breath. I have to stop, take a breath, blow on it again, and once it's good and going, then I can stop. And it, frankly, it usually takes me three or four breaths to get a fire going. No, I don't put gasoline on it, too. <laughs> I see both Gerald and Bobby saying, your head is too close. <laughs> That's an artifact of, of, of the, uh, the video, okay? So, okay. Is this the way it is with the Spirit? Is this why the Spirit came in waves for the disciples? Because God, need to take a, God needed to take a breath to blow. The second place my mind went is an experience that I had as a boy in Kansas. Now, Kansas is the, the, the center of the Great Plains. It's a place where hawks and vultures and other soaring things abound. And one day, I had nothing to do. And so I was laying in the tall grass in a field next to our house just looking up at the sky and watching these clouds lazily float by. Now this is, this is what kids used to do before they had electronic entertainment and it was so enjoyable. Okay. So I'm laying there and all of a sudden this hawk comes lazily soaring into my field of vision and it gets right above me and all of a sudden it starts circling. <laughs> 
and I'm thinking, oh no, does it think I'm a dead rabbit down here laying in the field? So I wiggled a little bit to make sure that it knew I was alive. Okay. <laughs> and then a second hawk came and joined it, and here they are circling, and I realized every time they take a circle, they get smaller, and I, and, okay? I was laying right underneath of a thermal, a column of warm air that's rising up upwards, and they were dipping in and out of the thermal to lift themselves higher and higher, and as they went higher and higher, other hawks and vultures saw what was happening, and they came rushing over, and pretty soon I had six or eight, you know, birds circling over me. It was like my own private circus. And then all of a sudden, that first hawk, way up there, just started shooting across the sky. I mean, this wasn't a lazy, well, I think I'm gonna go for a long glide. No, he was hightailing it, whoo, and not moving a feather. He had gotten up there high enough that the, he'd gotten caught in this invisible river, torrent of air that was racing across the sky. The clouds were lazily floating by high above. And here's this torrent, whoa! And one by one, those birds got up there and they caught the expressway, boom! And they were out of sight. Did you take that picture? No, I didn't take that picture. That's a cool picture, okay? But is this what it's like with the spirit? Do we have to position ourselves just right to catch the Spirit? Pray hard enough. Ask for it long enough. Be good enough. And then, wow, whammo, we're caught up in Holy Spirit power, come down. Of course, the classic illustration of waves is waves. I took Ethan to this beach last fall when we were over there, and uh, that's our grandson, Ethan. Uh, and um, we got there, and he just stood and looked and said, wow, wow. He's 18 months old. Okay, so he's an intelligent 18 month old, okay? And uh, so he and I then had a long conversation about how waves are, what waves are and how they come about, okay? So after all, he's my grandson. I've got to, I've got to bring him up right. Okay. Now, waves are not currents of water. They're not moving, the water's not moving long distance. The water itself is just kind of spinning around in a circle. And if you're offshore, away from the surf, and you're swimming, that's exactly what you experience. As a wave comes through, it lifts you up, takes you a little bit towards shore, drops you down, and pulls you back away. Lifts you up, pushes you in, drops you down, pulls away. Because that is what the water is doing. That's why it also can be very dangerous to get caught up in some of those waves. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But as that water is spinning, it's bumping the water next to it, and then the water next to it starts spinning. Now, when you're out away from shore, that's really kind of a pleasant experience. Unless there's a chop, waves coming from different directions, and then pretty soon your inner ear starts to, to rebel, and then your stomach joins as a revolution, and then your head, and you, you get the idea. Okay? But what gets the water spinning? Well, the short answer is wind. Okay. That chop, that roughness out there on the water that you see, that's from local winds. They're kind of turbulent and blow a little short while, okay? And so you get this chop to the water. But these big, this, the swells, these big waves that are coming in, those, those have, take a lot of wind, and it can be thousands of miles away. Now, this is an, this is an animation at Windmap. 
if you Google wind map, okay, you can get a live animation of the winds over the entire continental United States right now. This, these are some historical winds, okay? But look how long these winds patterns are. I mean, all the way north to south, okay? Just, <clears throat> it takes winds like that to get waves like that. Is that what it's like with the spirit? Are we just at the mercy of the winds? We don't have any control when the waves come into the shore. Is it that way with the spirit? And Gerald, you mentioned last week that you saw a huge flock of geese. Huge flock, okay? Mm -hmm. Migration is another one of those periodic things that we experience. And here in the, spe in the U.S., some species travel in these huge flocks, and others migrate in ones and twos. They just show up in our yards, like robins. Have you ever seen a flock of robins flying through the sky? And yet they disappear and they reappear, okay? Bluebirds are the same way. Even hummingbirds migrate thousands of miles. Now here in the U.S., it's birds that we see. When we were in Africa, there were migratory birds, but they didn't come in those huge flocks. Instead, what was really visible was the human migration. Now, this is a terrible picture, okay? Because it was taken with a Polaroid digital camera, which was the first digital camera. It had a whole 300 KB, okay? Man, it was a great picture 20 years ago, okay? But what you're seeing here are some Fulani women carrying their kitchens. The Fulanis are a nomadic tribe of, of cattle herders. And every year, they travel a circuit of 2,000 miles following the fresh grass that comes up after the rains come so their cattle can graze. And then when the grass starts to, starts to harden, they move on and they just keep following the fresh grass. Now, before you start feeling too hard, too, too bad for the women carrying their kitchens, right? I mean, they're carrying the whole kitchen, including the pantry there, okay? But they don't have to carry the house, too, okay? They, they take the house down, they just live in tents, and they, uh, they put that on the back of their cattle. The precise triggers for animal migration have been really hard for us to decipher scientifically. It has something to do with a complex interplay of how many hours of daylight there is, what the temperature is, what foods are present or not present, and even genetic variation. Because even within a single species, like robins, some, some will leave at one time, others will leave at another time, given the same day length, same temperature, same food supplies. Is that what it's like to, for the spirit? The Bible says, to everything there is a season and a time for everything under the sun. Is that what it's like for the spirit too? It's just going to come when it's going to come. Now, I know I'm speaking in analogies here, okay? And what does all of this mean? Well, I'm not trying to be an authority for you. I'm, trying to, I'm asking you, I'm inviting you to think about this question. because it's something that Christians have a lot of angst over. Do I have the Spirit? How can I get the Spirit? I need more of the Spirit. Well, let's go back to our question. When was the Spirit given? Or maybe we should change that. Since we now know that it was given repeatedly, why was the Spirit given? Time is different for no reason. Exactly. Okay? When you read the story of Pentecost, we usually think, ah, Pentecost, miracle working power. But when you read the actual story, it talks about this is this is really this was really startling for me. 
They, they, were, they were speaking in tongues, yes, but do you know what they were saying? They were confessing their sins and repenting. It says they were confessing their sins and repenting and rejoicing in the grace that God had given. Now, that doesn't sound like an evangelistic series to me, but that's what got people's attention. And when you three read through the rest of the New Testament, yes, you have Peter who had the gift of healing, raised the dead. People would send him handkerchiefs hope, and ask him to pray over them, hoping to be healed. They put the sick out in the streets, hoping that his shadow would come over. But you don't read any stories like that about Paul or Barnabas or any of the other apostles. Paul cast out a demon, a demon, Okay? But we don't read stories of miracles following Paul all over the place. What? He raised the dead. Okay. Yeah, those stories stand out because they are so uncommon. And yet, what do we think today? If, if we have the Spirit in the church, we're going to be seeing miracle working power. Paul emphasized that there is a diversity of gifts. Amen. I'm not belittling the gift of healing. But when we as Christians think, I don't have the Spirit unless we are setting ourselves up. Okay? What did Paul say about the gifts of the Spirit? He said, seek after the gifts of the Spirit. But let me show you something even better that the Spirit has to offer. That's 1 Corinthians 13. And what did he say was the best thing the Spirit has to offer? Not just love, but a life transformed so that love flows through it unadulterated. In Ephesians, when he talks about the Spirit and the gifts, he says that the, the Spirit was given for the building up of the church so it could get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's not what he says at all. For the edification of the saints until you grow and are healed and all your faults are removed and you stand perfect in the image of Christ. Paul didn't emphasize the Holy Spirit as an evangelistic tool. He didn't emphasize miracles what he emphasized was the Holy Spirit's transformation of our lives. Amen. Now, in the upper room, if you read on the story there, Jesus says something that's been really hard for us Christians to, to understand. He says, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whoever sins you hold on to are held on to. And some Christians, Protestants and Catholics alike, have interpreted that, that the leaders in the church have the power to forgive sins or to, re or to prevent sins from being forgiven. Now, I don't see that in the rest of Scripture. So let's just play a mind game here. Imagine, last week we were having church and all of a sudden, a mob breaks down the door. And they come here, and they grab me, and they take me out and lynch me. I'm not saying I'm Jesus, okay? I'm wanting you to have a thought exercise here. They grab me, they take me out, and they lynch me. What are you going to do? Go that way. <laughs> You're going to go that way! Yes, that's exactly Sorry. right. Okay, we're abandoning you. <laughs> and if somebody stops you as you're going out the door... Are you part of us or are you part of them? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that man. <laughs> and then this week, after you know I've been murdered, I show up in church again. <laughs> First of all, would we come back to church? <laughs> okay. You're hiding, okay? <laughs> and all of a sudden, I pop into the room, 
Okay. Fairfield ain't too friendly anymore. <laughs> Think about the dynamics that would be going on amongst us as a group. The self-recrimination. The finger pointing. But we share our responsibility. But you left me. Yeah. Okay? I mean, it's just human nature. Okay? We blame ourselves, but we blame others too. And you know, I'm not as guilty as Katrina is. Okay? Sorry, I I did, she led the way out the door. I just followed. Okay? <laughs> The work that the Holy Spirit had to do in the lives of the disciples at that point was enormous. And I think what Jesus was saying here was both a promise and a warning. If you accept forgiveness, which only comes from God, but if you accept forgiveness, you will be forgiven. But if you hold on to your guilt... There's nothing I can do for you. If you extend forgiveness to the other members of the group, their sins will be forgiven. You will have reconciliation and you will become one again. But if you hold on to that blame, there's nothing the Spirit can do. same is true today. If we refuse to let God bear our, the burdens for our past, for the sins that we have committed, we are going to have this sense of guilt. And if Jesus' words are true, we will never experience forgiveness. If we hold on to the sins that have been committed against us, the traumas that we have experienced, the evil things that have come into our lives, and we hold on to the blame and the resentment, we will never experience the freedom that the Spirit offers us. Now that's a big challenge. That's something I can't do, okay? There are things in my past, things that have happened that I don't wanna let go because I'm afraid they're gonna happen again. And if I remember them and I hold on to it, I'll hold myself, you know, I'll, I'll be defended. But you know what? Every time I let one of those things go and I say, God, I want you to take this. I, I, I want to stop being bitter over this. And I'm just going to depend on you to protect me. Every time I do that, I get such a sense of freedom and liberation in my life. Now, when we step back to the first commission, when Jesus sent out the, sent out the, the 12, this is where the miracle working power came in. Raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Not at Pentecost. They already had it. They weren't waiting for Pentecost to get miracle working power. They were already working miracles. And it wasn't just the 12. Luke tells us about 70 others that were sent out. Before the resurrection, before Jesus was glorified, before Pentecost, all of these gifts had already been given. You know, it's interesting today that when we think of Pentecost, this is what we think of. When we hear about Pentecost, this is what we hear of. It's almost as if Christians today, myself included, are like the disciples. We are interested in the power of the kingdom, not the heart. We really want that miracle working power. And when we don't have it in our lives, we question whether the spirit is, is present. So that's all I wanted to share today. Okay? The spirit is promised to you.
Jesus said that the Father wants to give you the Spirit just as much as a parent wants to give a child a good gift. All we have to do is accept it. So let it wash over you like waves, fulfilling your needs as they arise. Stop trying to control it, possess it, dictate what it needs to do right now. Because God knows the needs of your heart better than you know it yourself. Let the wind go where it will. He will supply your needs. Now, here at church, we're going to talk about some local issues. But I want to extend an invitation to you again. If you're local and homebound and you want some fellowship, just PM me. If you're not local and you want some fellowship, just PM me. But reach out to the body of Christ where you are. Stop holding back. Let the Spirit lead in your life. Let Him move you. Now next week, we'll be celebrating another aspect of our circle of strength, and I look forward to having you join us again.